Geopolitics and Empire is joined by New York Times bestselling author and award-winning journalist Richard Poe. He's the author of Shadow Party, How Soros, Clinton, and 60s Radicals Seize Control of the Democratic Party. He's writing a new book on the history of globalism, which is what we'll be discussing. Public service announcement. I am being censored and deplatformed, so please don't forget to sign up to the free email list, Telegram channel, Twitter, and other social media. Leave a donation if you can. And one big way to help is writing a review on Apple Podcasts. All right, Mr. Poe, how are you? And how is the new book uh, coming along? Well, I'm great, thank you. And um, uh, the new the new book is coming along very well. I've been writing portions of it, I guess you might say, on lourockwell.com. So um, if people want to see my new stuff, that's the place to go. It's on the subject, as you said, of globalism and where this strange phenomenon of globalism came from. And of course, a lot's been written about this subject. But um, what I had discovered over the years is that there's a systematic distortion in the way globalism is presented, even in alternative media. And sometimes I think this is done inadvertently, simply because people are just repeating what they've seen in the known alternative sources. But what I'm referring to specifically as a distortion is this kind of idea that there are these strange James Bond villain sort of people, these secluded multi-billionaires, uh, people like David Rockefeller, uh, George Soros. Uh, I'm sure you could name half a dozen of these figures and that they're all sort of old white men gleefully rubbing their hands together and meeting in places like uh, Davos and the Bilderberg. And on one level, all of that's true. Of course, there are such individuals, and they do meet in such places, and I'm sure they even gleefully rub their hands together upon occasion. But I think there's also a psyop involved in putting these kinds of figures in front of us because it cartoonizes the whole subject, it makes us feel, first of all, that there are only, there are certain individuals who are doing this somehow. They're, they're like, uh, as I said, James Bond villains, people who live on an island somewhere with no connection to any state level power or any responsible government that we're familiar with. And this, I think, is the, the PSYOP part of it. It's the part of it that's meant to distract us from the fact that globalism is not an exotic, crazy idea that's being perpetrated by a few madmen uh, operating in secret. Globalism is something that's being done by our own governments, with our taxpayer money, very largely. And that's what I try to focus on. In in a sense, I, I'm trying to look past the James Bond villain aspect of it and, in a sense, look at the obvious, beginning with this obvious fact that we live in a world today which is an English-speaking world. I mean, basically, if you're not a speaker of English, you have to learn English if you want to get anywhere, if you want to get by. And the usual explanation for this global dominance of the English language and English-speaking peoples is supposedly there's an entity called the American Empire, which is so overwhelmingly powerful that it has no rival, that supposedly we're, um, we, I'm American, so I'll say we, the American imperialists are so uh, are so powerful today that we are a hyperpower. We have been called, and we we can do whatever we want. No one can stop us. And this is why everybody speaks English because this American empire somehow became master of the entire globe. And the problem with this analysis is that if you actually look at the history of the last 120 years or so. Let's begin at the beginning of the 20th century. The world 
even then was rapidly becoming an English-speaking world, but it wasn't the United States of America that was doing it. I, I mean, quite frankly, 120 years ago, uh, in the 1890s, let's say, we were just getting our frontier secure. We were, you know, starting to uh, reach out beyond the 48 states, but I mean, we were still putting putting down uh, Indian revolts uh, as late as 1909, I think, was the last recorded one. And although I'm not saying that Americans were unambitious, uh, I mean, we are an empire, without a doubt. We we have always been an empire. In fact, uh, George Washington uh, referred to the, th the original 13 states as an empire. He said that famously in a speech in New York, which is why New York is called the Empire State. Th those words come directly from George Washington. So our founding fathers, some of them, they didn't shrink from the idea of being an empire. But we were a different sort of empire than, let's say, the British. We were a land empire. Our focus was on expanding from sea to shining sea. And during the time period that I'm going to tell you about, let's say starting in the 1890s, 1900, we hadn't finished expanding from sea to shining sea. We were still in the process of conquering the frontier, securing the frontier, and just beginning to look beyond it. Well, we were building railroads, uh, most of which were uh, capitalized by British bankers because we didn't have the capital ourselves. People forget these things. We, we were not such a colossus then as we are now. So during this, during this time period, this is when the, um, the idea of globalism and the, the doctrines and dogmas of globalism that we still live with today were being formed and they weren't being formed by Americans. They were being formed by the British because unlike the United States of America, the British at that time actually had very practical and realistic reasons for thinking about global government because they had attained so much, uh, so much power over the world both in terms of their so-called formal empire, by which is meant those areas of, of which they had, of which were formal dependencies in some legal and or military sense, but also what has been called the informal empire. And um, British historians, uh, the two, two in particular, very influential uh, British historians named uh, Gallagher, and Robinson, I think it's John Gallagher and uh, Ronald Robinson. They wrote a very influential paper in 1953, uh, and it was called The Imperialism of Free Trade, during which they basically explained how the empire works. Now, what, um, what Gallagher and Robinson explained is that if you only look at the formal British empire, which is the areas colored pink on, on the old maps, you will only be seeing the tip of the iceberg and you will not be seeing the rest of the iceberg that's underwater. That's exactly the analogy, the metaphor that they used. And they explain how Britain's method of, let's call it colonization, uh, of of other countries, other areas, it all had to do with commercial penetration. Basically, what it had to do with was taking uh, taking the British situation and putting everybody else in the same situation. What is Britain? It's a small island, rather poor in resources, never had a very large population, um, and basically from a quite an early age had to make its living on the sea through overseas trade. The British imperial system is based on imposing that condition on everywhere else in the world, and they call it interdependence. The idea is to set things up in such a way that every country in the world is interdependent on every other country, so that 
The worst thing you can be is a self-sufficient country, which uh, British imperialists began calling isolationism back in the in the early 20th century. And we Americans in particular were accused of this thing called isolationism precisely because at that time we were self-sufficient and we we were pursuing self-sufficiency and we had very little interest in getting involved in overseas adventures uh, of various kinds. And so a word was invented by British ideologues and this word was called isolationist. So whenever we look at the British imperial ideology, we must understand that it's a contest between interdependence, which is the British system. Everybody must trade with everybody else for the barest essentials of survival, as opposed to isolationism, trying to build a country which is self-sufficient and can provide for its own needs. This is contrary to the interests of British imperialism. So what we find happening at the beginning of uh, the 20th century, really in the 1890s, is a great outreach by the British towards the United States because they recognized that the American, let's call it an empire, this, the American land empire that was taking form was going to be a formidable competitor to them. And they would much prefer to have us as an ally. And so various schemes were hatched at this point. It was pretty much assumed, um, uh, often the year of 1893, or I'm sorry, 1897 is taken as a kind of hallmark because that was uh, Queen Victoria's Diamond Jubilee. It's often seen as the, the kind of high water mark of what we conventionally think of as, as British imperialism. In that year, in that era of the 1890s, the British were seeking to enlist the goodwill of the United States to help them run their empire. And actually, for a very specific reason, to take on more of the burden of militarily maintaining their empire. And this was done very explicitly through publications and speeches and uh, also, you know, teachings that were right out there in the public place. You, you can still read these books. You can download them from Google Books, many of them. Uh, Andrew Carnegie was very much involved in producing this kind of material, uh, writing these kinds of books himself, which basically said that the U.S. and the U.K. had a natural destiny together uh, because we we are of the same race, the same language, the same culture, and and we, we must naturally bond together to bring world peace, uh, to bring peace to the world, basically by dominating it. Now, what happened is conventionally in the conventional history. Supposedly, what happened is between the 1890s or 1900, and let's say 1945 or thereabouts, the British Empire just disappeared, literally. It just vanished. And suddenly we were left with an American empire, which controlled everything. But you can't find that event in the history books. You can't find the, the, the collapse of the British Empire. It's not there. What you find is many areas of the world which used to be part of Britain's formal empire, let's take India, the most famous, were they were taken out of the realm of formal empire and put into the realm of informal empire. And this paper I was telling you about, the, the Imperialism of Free Trade, 1953, by Gallagher and uh, Robinson, they use India as one of several examples to illustrate their point, they say they say that uh, India, at first, when the British first went there, it was part of their informal empire, and then it became part of their formal empire. And now they said, speaking from the 1953s perspective, now it's part of the informal empire again. So these are very high-level British historians. You know, they're not. Um, 
alternative voices or alternative thinkers. This is mainstream British imperial history. And the, what they're telling us that just because it's not colored pink on the map doesn't mean we, the British, don't run it. Quite the contrary. And what I, they I, I thought I would just add a modern example. I saw a video this week uh, of an Indian farmer uh, in Britain. Um, and, and, you know, they were protesting what, what the Indian government is trying to do now in India. And he was essentially saying that the Indian government is trying to create this uh, monopoly on the food supply to privatize the entire food supply of India, which is decentralized uh, at the moment. And this farmer is saying that, you know, th that would be like, um, you know, genocide. It, it would annihilate people uh, because and I'm assuming that this privatization would be from, you know, some uh, would, would go to these British, you know, European, American, Western companies. So that's that informal empire you're talking about today where, you know, who cares who's, who's formally running the government if this informal empire controls the total food supply uh, in India? Well, the, yes, I, I didn't know about that, but that's a very good example of the kinds of things, the kinds of pressures and obligations that can be imposed on people, even when they're not a formal dependency of Great Britain in this example. Now, I guess what I'm saying is, according to the model of Gallagher and Robinson, according to their own model, what happened between, let's say, 1900 and, well, let's pick a year, let's say 1976, because the process of decolonization actually went on through the 70s. Um, what happened during those years is not that Britain lost its colonies. I, I believe that is a propaganda narrative. I don't think that's what happened. I believe that very high-level planners simply looked at the balance sheet and they said, we're, we're a lot better off moving certain areas of the world from formal dependency on Great Britain into informal dependency, and then letting the Americans have the expense and trouble of doing the heavy lifting when there needs to be military enforcement or anything of that sort. And it seems to me that this was planned for a very long time. There are actually writings from the turn of the century, for example, which expressly advocate, you know, the writings by British statesmen. I, I believe one Lionel Curtis uh, wrote one such, actually saying at the turn of the century that that India will have, will, must be allowed to become uh, self-governing, that this was the plan even then. And it was simply a matter of waiting for the right time, waiting till the Indians were ready, waiting till all the circumstances were in place. So the overwhelming fact is that the British fought two world wars, not just one, but two. And both of those world wars, they won. And they won them both the same way by getting a lot of other English-speaking countries to fight on their side, as well as some non-English-speaking countries as well, but especially the United States. And they won those wars. How, how can you be a globe-spanning power such as Great Britain was when this all started? How can you be such a great power? How can you fight two great wars in which you absolutely crush and destroy all of your enemies, all of your rivals? How can you do that and then supposedly end up with nothing? How does that happen? This is the official narrative that we're asked to believe, and I don't, I don't believe it. I, I think what actually happened, and I, I wrote about this um, in an article that's, that's up on lourockwell.com right now, um, and it's called how, uh, how the British Sold Globalism to America. I described this, in, in the article, I described this phenomenon as soft power. It's the idea that a very small country such as England 
can exercise power over much larger and more populous countries, which logically you'd think they'd be able to overwhelm them with physical power. And the example I used was the massacre at uh, Amritsar in 1919, <clears throat> excuse me, in which uh, 50 uh, British soldiers uh, massacred uh, several hundred uh, Indian protesters. And the interesting thing about that incident is that those 50 riflemen were, were Indian people in British uniforms. Their commander was British. And when he ordered them to open fire, they did. And I said, that's soft power. Now, this term soft power is kind of fashionable in the world of uh, policy um, wonks uh, today. And a, a lot of people argue about what it means. Perhaps some of these experts would disagree and say, that's not soft power. That's not what we mean at all. But soft power is defined as being able to seduce, to attract, to co-opt people into doing things they wouldn't otherwise want to do. And this is clearly the case with my little illustration of these Indian riflemen at Amritsar, because nobody forced them to do that. They did that because there was status attached to being in the British Army. And it was important enough for them to have that job and to have that status and to wear that uniform and to take pride in having that identity. It was important enough to them that they would obey whatever orders they were given, uh, even orders that would cause them to, uh, to kill their own countrymen. <clears throat> Excuse me. Yeah, I would say that's an important point. And I, I've taught at an elite university here um, in Mexico, which is pretty much uh, subscribed to globalist uh, ideology. And I could say the same thing that see the same thing that you're talking about, where a lot of people uh, are globalist apparatchiks. And it's because I think of this prestige and, and status. And I myself... <laughs> I, I was a nonconformist and dissident and an anti-globalist. And so I would get into trouble, but I can see the same thing uh, happening right now as well. Yes. And <clears throat> excuse me. I like your term global apparatchik uh, because there is this class of people who subscribe to globalism because they benefit from it personally, because they have been they have been lured and attracted and seduced by the idea of being part of this globalist class. And I, I return again to that paper um, the, by Gallagher and Robinson because they address this globalist apparatchik class specifically. The way they describe it is they say that when Britain goes into an area and basically imposes what they call the imperialism of free trade. They basically take an area which may not have had any foreign trade at all, and they pressure, pressure them or lure them into basing their whole economy on foreign trade. What Gallagher and Robinson say is when you do that, there will be a certain class of people who rise up who are deriving so much benefit from this new business of foreign trade, that they'll take care of any internal problems because in their own interests, they will form an interest group and a powerful interest group with British support, which will make sure that the, the doctrine of so-called free trade, uh, the doctrine of interdependence, the doctrine of depending for your very livelihood on foreign trade, that this doctrine is enforced and that those who try to preach self-sufficiency will be denounced and stigmatized and condemned as this evil thing called an isolationist. And so um, I didn't mean to harp so much on this, this paper by Gallagher and Robinson, but I, I actually reread it this morning, and I was struck by how much is in that little paper. I, I would encourage anyone interested in this subject to read it, 
because it really explains how the whole thing works, is that you get people to depend on free trade and then a, a class, let's call it a neo-colonial class within this area, this market that's been opened up, will have a self-interest in preserving that system. And so the point I'm trying to make with these articles and in my book, in a sense, it's you could call it an apologetic. As an American who loves my country, um, I'm very tired of seeing every problem in the world blamed on the United States. And frankly, that wouldn't bother me if I believed it were true. If I thought that the American empire were really actually responsible for all these things that are happening uh, around us, in, in, you know, including the particularly nightmarish events of the, the last uh, couple of years, if I really thought this was somehow all um, a conspiracy of American imperialists, if I really believed this to be true, I'd take it on the chin. I'd be out there with all these other people on Twitter saying, oh, I feel so ashamed to be an American. Look what we're doing to the world. But I've spent so many years studying this problem, this question of empire and this question of who runs this world and how do they run it and i simply i simply see no evidence that the united states is actually calling the shots certainly we have massive physical military and economic power to bring to bear but as i explained in my article in lou rockwell that went up today our foreign policy is directly controlled by uh, by uh, a, a non supposedly non governmental organization called the Council on Foreign Relations, and there is no question, uh, as I set forth in the article, the history is has been published in uh, respected academic books and journals. It's very very clear that. This outfit, the Council on Foreign Relations, is a British front, and it was actually formed as 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 part of uh, of a larger group that split into two parts. And one was in New York, the others in London. The one in uh, in London is called the Royal Institute of International Affairs. The one in uh, New York is called the Council on Foreign Relations. They communicate secretly under a code of secrecy called the Chatham House Rules. And there is no question that this CFR, as it's abbreviated, uh, it's, it's nicknamed the, the real State Department because there is no question that it sets our foreign policy. And there is no question, if you go back through the history, that the, the British created this structure they created this this um, structure of two groups, one in London, one in New York, for the express purpose of harmonizing and coordinating British and U.S. policy because they didn't like certain U.S. policies and they, they, wanted, to, uh, they wanted the U.S. to be in a relationship with Great Britain that was less independent and more like Canada. It was, act, it was a conscious attempt to actually move us toward the Canadian model. Canada, as you know, has always been um, a, a dependency of the British crown. It's always been a colony of England in some form or another. In 1867, it was granted the status of a dominion, which simply meant that it was self-governing internally, but that its foreign policy would be overseen and controlled by London. And this is pretty much the setup that in one form or another you have in all of the, the English-speaking colonies, uh, although they're not called colonies anymore. Uh, they call them commonwealth realms. They, they, they're always changing what they call them, but 
it really comes down to the same thing. They remain in some way under the control of the British crown uh, to the extent that in 1975, the Australian prime minister, uh, Go Whitlam, was actually dismissed from his post by the Queen of England because she was displeased with something or other. And this, um, this recently became a big scandal a couple of years ago in Australia because some confidential letters pertaining to this came out. And people in Australia were, were shocked and stunned and, you know, saying, well, how can this happen? How can the Queen dismiss our Prime Minister? Well, because that's the law. That's how it works. This is her royal prerogative to do this. She can dismiss prime ministers. She can dissolve parliaments. She can do all of that in those countries which which have that relationship with England of being Commonwealth realms. But here were all these Australians living in Australia, and they were shocked. They didn't know that she had this power. And I can understand why they didn't know, because if you go on the internet, and try to look up what are the powers of the British monarchy, what are the royal prerogatives, you'll get so much gobbledygook, so much double talk. You'll get so much verbiage, which appears to be written in English, but it doesn't seem to mean anything by the rules of English grammar. It, it's just a, a strange kind of uh, a purposefully vague uh, massive verbiage, very difficult to understand. Yeah, th this was my next uh, question, and I wanted to tie it back to free trade. Um, by the way, I had, I think a year or two ago, the former director of the Royal Institute, uh, Chatham House, uh, Victor Bulmer Thomas, uh, on the podcast talking about U.S. empire, so people can go check that out. Uh, and, and so you wrote about this in your new article, you know, free trade. If we think about free trade, how did the European Union begin? It began, began with a trade agreement. How did uh, NAFTA begin, right? Uh, I, I kind of trace NAFTA back to 1980, where we had the, the Bilderberg meeting, and people can read the report where it, they discussed in 1980 already creating a North American common market. And then what happens? 1989, we get the US-Canada uh, free trade agreement. 1994, we get NAFTA, where Mexico joins. And so it seems now that you know one of their strategies uh, of globalism is using this model of World Federation, regionalism, regional integration, using the the EU model, and you know, again, as you say, people can find these designs and strategies laid out in the first half of the 20th century. Back then, there was something called the Atlantic uh, Union, and now that Britain has left the EU, it, it seems to be, as as you're talking about, seeking to integrate with Canada, New Zealand, and Australia, or Kanzuk, uh, as you say, and mm -hmm. I wouldn't be I wouldn't be surprised if it forms a regional union with them. And even includes the United States at some point. Uh, and then we have, you know, the South American Union, the African Union, the Middle Eastern Union. They're attempting, you know, the CFR wrote about five or 10 years ago about there's a title people can find, you know, the Middle Eastern Union. We have the Eurasian Union, the Southeast Asian Union. So, you know, what are your thoughts then? You know, you were talking about free trade, and that seems like the first step was free trade to get these countries into a, a union. And now the second step is political uh, union and then, you know, military union, because they're talking about an EU army now. Uh, the Middle East is talking about an Arab NATO. So, you know, is, is this then, uh, what are your thoughts on this regional union? Well, as you said, um, this has been the plan for a very long time. We can go back more than 100 years and find um, many writings about this idea of regionalism and regional unions. And, you know, the, the United, this is all done through the UN system, by the way. Now, now the UN was formed in uh, 1945. Prior to that, of course, they tried to, to uh, create the League of Nations, but all of these regional unions are or proposed and organized and implemented through the UN system. And the UN system was always a British idea from its conception. It was conceived, the idea of a global peace league or a global government of some kind was openly discussed in, in uh, Victorian England. And 
Now, most of us learned in school that the idea of the the uh, League of Nations was first proposed by a U.S. president, Woodrow Wilson. Um, I certainly learned that in school. We were told he was an idealist. He wanted world peace. He wasn't like all those selfish, greedy, violent European leaders who just wanted to grab everybody's land. He came with this pure American heart, wanting everyone to live in peace. And he proposed a League of Nations, but these short-sighted people in the U.S. Senate refused to go for it and voted it down. That's the fairy tale. In truth, Woodrow, this was not Woodrow Wilson's idea at all. It was a British idea, and Woodrow Wilson was basically spoon-fed this idea, this whole concept of globalism, by a network of British spies who surrounded him at the White House. Uh, there was a man named uh, Colonel Edward Mandel House. He was a Texan whose father was born in Britain. During the Civil War, Colonel House's father basically acted as, as a British agent. He ran uh, a fleet of blockade runners who ran the Union blockade, brought cotton to England, and brought back munitions to arm the Confederate rebels. Um, Colonel House and his brothers were all sent to English English boarding schools. So they were there was a very close uh, family relationship with the British and a political relationship and a, a relationship of, I guess, what you could call covert operations. Now, this Colonel House became very, very close to Woodrow Wilson. He was his closest confidant. He didn't have an official position uh, in the administration, but Everything went through him, and he was acting as a liaison between Wilson and the British. And also another another person who was close to Wilson was, um, his name was uh, Weissman, Sir William Weissman, and he was the station chief for the United States for the British Secret Intelligence Service. He and um, House became very close. House introduced him to the president. And they all became very, very close friends together, even taking vacations together. And to this day, this man, uh, Weissman, is, is honored in official histories of British espionage. He has a very high place of honor. He's been called the, um, the, the, the greatest agent of influence, wh whoever graced British intelligence, because of the job he did on Woodrow Wilson manipulating him into following the British agenda of entering World War I on the British side and then proposing this uh, so-called League of Nations. There's actually a uh, correspondence from the British Foreign, uh, Foreign Secretary, Sir Edward Gray, to Colonel House. Uh, one letter in particular in 2015, uh, Sir, Sir Edward Gray wrote to House saying, well, we would like to form a League of Nations after the war, but it won't look good if, if we, the British, propose it. Do you think you could get President Wilson to propose this idea and pretend it's his own? And Colonel House said, sure, no problem. And that's exactly what happened. So we have now more than 100 years of history saying that globalism, basically world government, was an American idea proposed by an American president. But anyone who just looks, however casually, into the published records can easily see that none of this was true, that the whole enterprise was British from the get-go. And also, by the way, H.G. Uh, Wells, the science fiction writer, he wrote a book in 1914 and and this book was called the war to end war and it was a it was a propaganda book uh basically commissioned and assigned by the british war propaganda bureau of which wells was a secret operative and it and so he wrote this book and in it he sets forth the whole concept of the league of nations global government and says this war is a great opportunity for us to push this that's 1914. The next year, 1915, Sir Ed Edward Gray says, can we get President Wilson to 
stand up and say, this is his idea. Sure, no problem. And it all happened. So all of these things were contrived. But the concept itself was a British concept from the get-go. And not only was it not an American idea, but in some ways it was really antithetical to the American spirit. And again, not because we're wonderful, angelic people, but just because we have our own way of being self-interested and imperial, which doesn't involve setting up global governments and and trying, <clears throat> excuse me, trying to mind everybody else's business in the world, you know, especially back then, uh, circa 1919, 1920. This was so antithetical to the American spirit. And, <clears throat> and so in this very ironic way, almost as, a, almost as if it were a joke, we've been set up through propaganda as, as the driving force behind globalism. And even to this day, with Brexit, uh, this story came out that uh, supposedly uh, Barack Obama was threatening the poor British and saying, if you dare uh, leave the European Union, there will be consequences. Remember that, that story? And I'm not going to say, uh, you know, how that story came about or what it really means, but it's so typical of the way these propaganda narratives play out, that somehow the evil American empire is always responsible for these things, and especially globalism. And, and by the way, I just wanted to mention, in the, in the, um, the story I told you before about how Australia's Prime Minister, Go Whitlam, was dismissed by Queen Elizabeth II by her royal prerogative, as set forth in British law. Well. When the scandal broke with the palace letters, um, I, I think it was a couple years ago, something like that, all of a sudden, uh, the, the British press, uh, The Guardian, came out with this article saying it was the CIA who toppled Go Whitlam for some reason because he, he wasn't cooperating with some, uh, he, he wanted some American bases removed or something like that. So all of a sudden we get this change of subject. Oh, it wasn't the queen exercising her lawful prerogative and dismissing her prime minister as she has every right to do. And as she did in fact do, it was the evil Americans always poking around in other people's business with their CIA and even a, such a great ally and, and a uh, fellow uh, Anglophone country as Australia. Imagine the evil CIA went in and removed their prime minister. Well, again, I, I don't know the full story behind the CIA angle, but when I see things like that, something that the British obviously did, in this case, the Queen of England herself, and suddenly the CIA did it, that's, that's how... British propaganda deals with these questions of globalism and sovereignty. When people get outraged because their sovereignty has been infringed, all of a sudden the stories come out and the fingers start pointing, of course, it's the evil Americans. And so this is a big part of why I feel somebody needs to balance the record a little bit. And so, so we can so we can know whether you're for globalism or not, what really happened instead of some self-serving lies that have been dished up by the British Foreign Office to cover their own tracks in all this, even against their own people. And um, so I guess in a way, I'm, I'm perhaps admitting to my own bias. As an American, I resent being blamed for a lot of things that aren't actually our fault, as far as I can tell. And I don't think, I don't think that it's a good, um, I, I don't think it's good for our country to acquiesce in, in allowing England to put out these kinds of narratives, but we do acquiesce. And that's because just as in every other country, which is, be, is subject to British manipulation, as we've discussed, 
we have a class of people in this country who feel that their their place in society, perhaps their business, their money, their status, their sense of importance comes from cooperating with the British. And that somehow, you know, in some ways, I, I, I think that we as a people, we Americans, I, some, somehow we haven't completely gotten over this colonial mindset, this colonial, let's call it self-hatred, this idea that somehow we're less than people in the mother country, that somehow they're naturally superior to us and that we want to we want their approval and we want to please them i think that's very much present in the american mentality even after all these years and after so, so much history i think there's still there is that there is still that subservient spirit when it comes to england uh, unlike it, towards any other country it's still there and the british know it's there and they know how to play it if I could, yeah, I, I would agree with myself as an American. You know, when I was younger, I kind of veered a bit more. I'm I'm not left. I'm a conservative, but in terms of criticizing American empire, I kind of went a bit left leftward. And now I'm kind of coming back to some of the points that you're talking about, understanding the source of globalism. And yes, when America does, you know, invades uh, Iraq illegally, you know, we have some culpability for following those orders, you know, at least the people that sent us there and more Americans should be, you know, rising up uh, and complaining uh, about this. I wanted to fast forward uh, just a bit to get your thoughts on, um, you know, the, the, what's happening now with this great reset. Is this just like the next phase of globalism and global empire, this, this whole great uh, reset where it seems like, I mean, they just use the Bretton Woods institutions, which we were talking about the creation of the UN they use the Bretton Woods institutions to shut down every nation uh, on the planet. And it's like we're on the cusp of world government almost. This is unprecedented. You know, the Babylon or the Persian Empire or Rome never could have imagined such a thing. And so what, what are your thoughts going uh, forward on the Great Reset? Because things look pretty bleak right now. And on top of that, I had another question, you know, related to the Great Reset, where there's this talk of going after Russia and China, you know, war with Russia. Uh, and China, who who it seems like th they are these sovereign national entities that uh, are not completely on board with the Great Reset, and so it's almost like a repeat of you were talking about World War One and the League of Nations, World War Two, and the UN. You know, are, are will could we see some type of World War Three Great Reset? You know, uh, the, this third attempt at getting global government. Well. Yes, is the short answer. I, I believe for sure the Great Reset is the next phase of globalism. And of course, there are a lot of scare stories out there. I, I don't know how quickly it's going to happen, how imminently, or how much is simply testing people and trying to unnerve people, or if this really is the end game. But it certainly has been no secret. Uh, since I was in, in my early 20s, I, I certainly remember reading about plans for uh, depopulating the Earth, great, reducing the, the Earth's population by many billions. Uh, these things have been talked about and planned for many decades and really more generations. And here again, I think if you look at this this idea, these these ideas that are coming out from the World Economic Forum, from the UN, uh, things like Agenda Twenty One, the Great Reset. If you really stop and look, what what lies behind it? What is the spirit that lies behind this? What is the 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 kind of thinking? that generates these ideas. You look at those videos that were put out by the World Economic Forum uh, showing streets empty of people and saying, oh, isn't this wonderful? 
there's you know uh, no pollution there's no carbon there's no people and people on twitter are looking at this thing what is he talking about this is horrible he's showing you know empty cities no business no commerce no no pedestrians what we're seeing there i think is the difference between an aristocratic view of the world and a, a sort of hardworking middle class view? The hardworking middle class person wants to see a bustling city with stores open, people working, earning a living, and just doing the normal things of life. But there's a class of people who have never forgotten the way they used to live, where they owned all the land, all of it. Anybody who lived on their land was a serf, a slave. They're basically their property who could be treated any way they wanted them to. And they could be herded like just some form of livestock. And if you if there were too many of them, there were ways to get rid of them. One way is just send send them all off to fight in a war, which you had the right to do as a great landlord in an aristocratic society. And so I th think here, once again, when we see these weird videos saying, oh, look how wonderful a city with no people in it. What we're seeing is something that is fundamentally not an American way of looking at things. It's just not in our psyche. This is in the psyche of European landed aristocracy. The idea that they are the chosen few and everyone else is a serf. And if there's too many serfs, it's just annoying and something must be done about it. And that's the only way I can explain this sort of thinking. They come out with all kinds of scientific studies saying, well, we have too many people, it's not sustainable, blah, blah, blah. And look, I'm not, I'm not dismissing the concept of overpopulation. Some people completely dismiss it, but obviously, you know, there are limits to the, the population a certain area can sustain. But the kinds of depopulation that are being talked about, the, 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 you know, the, 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 the kind of downsizing of our whole civilization, coupled with the destruction of small business, the destruction of the middle class, it's very clear that what we see here is an aristocratic agenda. It's, it's an effort to eliminate this pesky thing called the middle class that somehow emerged at, in the last part of the Middle Ages, much to the annoyance of, of the great um, landlords and the, you know, the, the great um, landed aristocracy. And I, I just think they want, they want to get their prerogative back. They want to get back that power where basically a small group of families owns everything. That's why they're saying, you're not going to own anything, but you'll be happy, just like our serfs used to be happy. We fed them, you know, we gave, we gave them something to do, gave them work, and we gave them shelter, and you'll be fine as a serf. I don't think most Americans think this way, even rich ones. I think you have to, and again, it's not because we're angelic or perfect, but our national experience didn't, didn't cause us to think that way. We, we're a frontier society. We're used to having a lot of room. And we just don't, um, we don't, we don't have this, that nostalgia for, for uh, feudalism. Now, there may be Americans who, because of their family history and their intermarriages uh, with European families and for other reasons, indoctrination, acculturation, have been educated on how to think 
like a landed aristocrat. And I'm sure we've had those people from the very beginning, of course. Um, but it's not fundamentally an American way of looking at things. And so I don't mean to keep beating the dead horse, you know. I, I'm not reflexively apologetic for everything Americans do. I understand we're far from perfect. I get it. But when I look at these evil agendas of globalism and depopulation and the deliberate infliction of financial hardship and chaos on, on billions of people, I, I see something um, that is it's much more British than it is American. It's the British who have uh, a long history and experience of engineering uh, massive numbers, an engineering society and affecting massive numbers of people through these kinds of, um, these kinds of operations. I just don't think that, that uh, Americans don't have the experience. We don't have that in our culture unless somebody teaches it to us from the outside. I, I guess that's what I'm saying. That this, what we're seeing is a, a deep, deep knowledge of human nature, of economics, uh, of what we now call behavioral economics, of how people en masse will behave if you fine tune the economy this way and that. You don't just learn that overnight. You don't learn that because some smart college kid in a think tank wrote a paper and said, gee, look, we can manipulate the whole world by having depressions and and um, hyperinflation. These ideas don't just come from one person. These are generational ideas that are learned through centuries and centuries of wielding the scepter of imperium. And that's why I think that Americans and really all people need to start studying this subject of empire. Um, you know, a few years back during the, uh, the war on terror, the invasion of Iraq, all that stuff that was going on, there was um, a Scottish historian named Neil Ferguson who emerged and he was writing on this very subject from a pro-British point of view. He wrote one book in particular called Colossus, where he was essentially saying the same thing that I am. He was saying, you Americans, you have to get with it. You don't understand the business of empire and you need to learn because we British, he was still British then. I think now he's, he's a, a American. He's, he, I, I believe he's now an American citizen, but still, still singing from the same choir book. But he was basically saying exactly what I'm saying, that Americans just, he was saying, you guys, you just don't, you just don't understand what it takes to wield global imperial power. And you need to learn from the British. And he said it, he laid it out. Fascinating book, Colossus. So when I say these things, I'm not, um, I'm not repeating things that I read in some avant-garde um, alternative media someplace. I'm quoting and citing ideas from the champions at the, in many cases, the academic champions and apologists for Brit the British imperialism itself. People like Gallagher and Robinson, people like Neil Ferguson. I read these people, and what they say is very, very clear. They're, they're saying the British know how it's done. The Americans don't. You stupid Americans, you have to learn. At least, well, that's what Ferguson was saying. Gallagher and Robinson, I'm not sure they cared if the Americans ever learned. They were on a different tangent. But with Ferguson, it was so apparent because... He was really just scolding us, saying, you guys don't get it. This is, this is imperialism. This is how it's done. So 
when you ask about the Great Reset and this kind of new escalation we're moving towards, that's what I see. I see this is the full efflorescence of the, the essence of what this globalist idea was all about. It comes from that class of landed aristocracy who owned everything, and they liked it, and that's the way they want it to be. And all of this is now being engineered to bring it about, in my humble opinion. Yeah, I, I would agree with you. And I, I've given this some thought uh, as well. And I, I, I do think that, you know, Europe is the source uh, of this uh, globalism, the European aristocracy. And it's been that way for the last, you know, 2000 years, right? You know, the, the Roman Empire and then, the you know, the, the Holy Roman Empire, Britain. And so it seems... That's the geographic source, and you know they're they're merely using uh, America as the battering uh, ram, and so um, we'll be looking forward to uh, you fleshing out completely these thoughts uh, in your upcoming book on globalism. Uh, you are on Twitter now, and your website is richardpoe.com. Uh, is there any other website or project that we should know about? Well, I, if you if you wouldn't mind a, a moment of of um, crass self promotion, I would like to to show uh, my book, The Shadow Party, which I co wrote with David Horowitz. Um, this this book sells very well to this day, uh, and I think uh, one of the reasons why it, it's kind of timeless is because it's. It really deals with history, with long-term history, such as we've been talking about. It goes back to the 1930s, 40s, 50s, and 60s, and it talks specifically about the infrastructure that was set up to create permanent revolution, permanent turmoil in the streets of America. Going back to the 1930s, it addresses Saul Alinsky, the Cloward Piven strategy, all these things. Uh, you know, the, the Cloward Piven strategy was not known at all uh, by by uh, even by you know people interested in these subjects uh, we really kind of excavated that subject from the history books in the shadow party and showed how it's important and how it fits in with all of these um, machinations which resulted today have resulted today in um, not just the Democratic Party, but primarily the Democratic Party emerging as a, a force of revolution. And so I just wanted to give a little plug to the Shadow Party because it's, um, you know, it came out a few years ago, but it's it's actually selling better today than it ever did before. Um, and I think that's largely because the subject is still timely and it deals especially with um, George Soros and what his role is in all of these machinations. Yeah, I mean, definitely. I think that was written in 2010, so a decade ago. But I think what we witnessed with the 2020 uh, election uh, just nails, I mean, I think you nailed it with the whole, what happened with, with the Democratic Party and Clinton and, and, and Soros. Uh, I remember I had Paul, Dr. Paul Craig Roberts on a few months before the election, and he was saying basically America was, was going to experience its own Soros color revolution, and that's precisely... Uh, what happened. So, I mean, yes. you, you nailed it a, a decade ago, and I think that's why uh, it's it's still selling uh, well. So, I, I think we'll leave it there. I urge listeners to follow Richard uh, on Twitter. Uh, I do. I, I love your work there. And, you know, bookmark his website and definitely get a shadow party. And we'll be looking forward uh, to the new book. And so, again, thank you for being on Geopolitics Empire. Thank you. I hope you enjoyed this Geopolitics and Empire podcast interview. The website is geopoliticsandempire.com, and I encourage you to sign up for the free email list through which you can receive an update of every new podcast, as well as a long list of key news headlines once a week. We're being heavily censored. YouTube has deleted some of our videos, and we currently have one strike. Patreon has terminated our account. Facebook has restricted our page, and Reddit has been the leading posts. Our favorite social media channels are Telegram and Twitter. The best places to watch the podcast beyond YouTube are on Odyssey, BitChute, and Brighteon. 
The best places to listen to the podcast are on SoundCloud, Apple, Spotify, Google, or on any other podcast app. To help keep this podcast alive, leave a review on Apple Podcasts and wherever else, subscribe to all our platforms, and leave a donation if possible via Subscribestar, PayPal, Bitcoin, or Ethereum. You can also find us on MeWe, Minds, Gab, Float, VK, LinkedIn, and Instagram. Thanks for listening.